Can you turn with me to the book of Revelation? And this morning, I just want to read for you from Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, all the way down to chapter 21. Verse 11 to Revelation 21. Revelation 20, verse 11 to Revelation 21. We find here, my beloved brothers and sisters, the Apostle John recording for us what he saw about the future and he uses here spiritual pictures to describe for us things that may be difficult for us to understand on this side of the life. So here in Revelation 20 verse 11 we read in the Holy Bible, Then I saw a great white throne and he who sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things that were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and dead and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one, according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of the heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write! For these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give, give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with twelve gates and twelve angels at the gates, and names written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he was 
He who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, its length is as great as its breadth, and he measured the city with the reed. Twelve thousand furlongs, its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, one hundred and forty-five cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. The construction of his wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chetroni, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topax, the tenth chrysophus, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass, but I saw no temple in it. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light. And the nations of those who are saved shall walk in his life, and the kings of the earth bring their glory and honor into it. His gate shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. But there shall be no means enter it, anything that defiles or causes an abomination or a liar, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And my beloved brothers and sisters, we pause here in our reading through this portion of God's Word. We are coming almost to the end of the year 2018, and this morning I'm not supposed to be the preacher, but the preacher who is supposed to be here this morning is unable to come, and so I have taken over his place. And that's the reason why I have chosen to minister to you from this portion of God's Word which points you to the future events that will soon take place. As we come to the end of the year, you will remember, brothers and sisters, we have been persevering in our desire to read through the whole Bible at least once in a year and especially for the year 2018. Now, brothers and sisters, if you have been following us along this journey and you have been persevering in your commitment to read through the Bible this year, you would have come to almost the end of your reading plan, brothers and sisters. If not, for some of you, you might you even have already completed the reading through of the Bible for this year. My question to you, beloved brothers and sisters, is what is the heart of the message of the Bible? What have you learned? And what have you come to understand to be the heart of the message of the Bible? To answer that question, brothers and sisters, I call you to this portion of God's Word where you find the Lord Jesus Christ with His people in the world that is soon to come. There are three points I want to draw your attention to from this portion of God's Word, especially I this morning call your attention to verse 3 of 21, Revelation 21 and verse 3, where let me read for you again what he said. He says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them, and be their God. And here, firstly, brothers and sisters, you immediately can learn it here yourself to in verse 21 without me having to call your attention to it that God is gathering His people. As you read from the book of Genesis and now coming to the last book of the Bible, you realize that this journey through the Bible is the story of God gathering His people. That's what we are told here, especially in this verse. Behold, he says, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, 
and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Brothers and sisters, God is gathering a people in this world. These people is not just the Jews, as a lot of people misunderstood. The people of God, the people that God is gathering, they come from different races and languages. Salvation is never by your race. Not just the Chinese can be saved. The Malay to the Indian and anybody who would believe and trust and obey the Lord Jesus Christ. The covenant promise of God to those who would come remains the same. Look at what we are told there in verse 7 of chapter 21. It says that, I will be his God and he shall be my son. I want to draw your attention to what God has just said. Now, I will be his God. Who is the his? And he shall be my son. Who is the he? Well, the person is described there in verse 6. To him who turns, brothers and sisters. Meaning to say, even if you are not a Jew, but you thirst for God. Well, brothers and sisters, well, the Lord tells us here, the promise is yours. The promise of God is the same. Uh, that's what I want to draw your attention to. Can you turn back even to the Old Testament? Just uh, some examples from the Old Testament. Firstly, to Exodus chapter 3. And what are you told there? In chapter 3 and verse 7. How is God describing the people that He was about to save from Egypt? Look at the people who were suffering in a land of Egypt in bondage. Chapter 3 of Exodus and verse 7. God described them as what? My people. You see there? My people. In other words, brothers and sisters, God has a people in this world. But not everybody is His people. Because if every human being will be His people, then, then, then why say my people? Why not just say my human or my creatures? God has a people of all the creatures in this world. God has an elect people. God has chosen a group to be His people, to be identified and to be owned by Him. Then you go to the book, a book that we seldom read, the book of Ezekiel chapter 11. And read there in Ezekiel chapter 11 and verse 20. And there again you find the covenant promise of God and that is here repeated uh, in uh, Revelation 21. It says that in Ezekiel 11 and verse 20, My people, he says, they are God. You see that? It's always that way. When God addresses His people, He will say that they will be My people and I will be their God. You see, it's, it's always that way. The, 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 the problem, brothers and sisters, is this. That are you in this group of people that is identified by God? Are you His people? And is He really your God? Now, that has always been the message you will read. And I hope that in your reading through this year, the Holy Bible, you would have come across this covenant promise being repeated throughout the pages of the Holy Bible. And so when you come to the New Testament, you find the same message being conveyed. For example, if you now turn to the Second Corinthians chapter 6, then what do you find? You find the same covenant promise. The Second Corinthians chapter 6, what do you find in verse 16? It says that, I will be their God and they shall be my people. You see there, their God, my people, the same covenant pledge. The same covenant commitment, the same covenant promise God is giving to anybody who will thirst and come to Him. Go down to verse 11, verse 18, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 18. It says, A father to you, and then describing His people, my sons and daughters. You see there, brothers and sisters, it is a family. God has a people. And God has a people, and God is a father to this group of people, and they are made up of sons and daughters. There is no regard of your gender, 
You are a man and you are a woman and you are a man of God and you are a woman of God. You are a son and you are a daughter. That is why it is really amazing, brothers and sisters, to see what the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 8. Look at what he tells us there in Romans 8. Can you turn there? In Romans 8 and verse 14. Amazing, amazing things. In a different way, you find a promise, a covenant promise, being, being described in a different way. How is it stated there in Romans 8 and verse 14? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cried out, Abba, Father. You see that? You address God as Father. And He described you as sons of God. And how did you become a son of God, a daughter of God? It tells you very clearly, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. And it says that the Spirit of adoption. You only become a son of God, a daughter of God by adoption. Meaning to say you were not born. You were not born. You were adopted. You were born in sin and rebellion through Adam and Eve. But God, in His tender mercy, He looked down from heaven, He understood your rebellion, He saw your wickedness, He knew that you can never save yourself, He knew that you never, never will love God, never and never will see God, and yet out of the mystery of His compassion, that only God knows why He should show us His mercy, He looked upon us, He gave us His Spirit, and He made us willing and able to trust in His words. Brothers and sisters, you see, the same sermon is preached to you and to others. Why is, why is it possible? Why, how come you are able to believe, but others are not able to believe? How come you are able to accept the Bible, whereas others are unable and totally unwilling? It is due to this, brothers and sisters. Something happened in your soul, in your spirit. God touched you. God touch you that so much so deeply that you are even willing to die and be a martyr because of what God said. It's amazing, isn't it, brothers and sisters? We'll be told here again and again that as you read through the Bible, you get the same message. I will be your God and they shall be my people. God is gathering His people. The question is, who are His people? I have already alluded to it that they are the people that the Holy Spirit has called regenerated. And they are the people who manifested that the Holy Spirit has, has already worked in their hearts. And how do they show it? They show it externally by desiring God, by trusting for God. Who are these people? Actually, recently I read through the book of Revelation just a few days ago again. That is why I felt that when the speaker was unable to come, I felt that I must bring this message to you. Because on that morning, as I was sitting in my wife's office reading the book of Revelation, as I was reading through this chapter 21, I found myself reading verse 27. If you want to read, can you turn to the book of Revelation 21 and look at what I was reading, verse 27. And there I was caught by this verse, it says, But there shall be no means enter. In other words, nobody can enter. Nobody can enter this place. Nothing that defiles or causes an abomination and lie. But who can? Only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. That last sentence, that last part of the sentence really hit my heart very deeply. And my conscience too. Only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. I found myself, as I sat there in my wife's office, she was not in the room. And I immediately said, oh, please add my wife's name. Please add my two sons' name. Lord, in your mercy, please remember my two elders and their wives and their families. Lord, I do remember my brother is not a believer yet, and my sister, she is a member in a, in a Celtic church. Please remember everybody. And I just want you to know before God, I cannot lie, that I mentioned all your names. I mentioned my cousin, 
I said, Lord, remember Henry and his wife, Ikwe. Remember, remember their children. Remember Edmund and his family. Remember, oh Lord, remember Priscilla. Remember, oh Lord, remember Kersing. And everybody here, I will not prolong the conversation, but I want you to know, my brothers and sisters, I was so concerned for all of us. I say us, not you, because I was concerned for myself and my family too. Are we in the Lamb's Book of Life? Are you concerned enough, brothers and sisters, that you are in the Lamb's Book of Life? Don't talk about others. Are you concerned about your own salvation, brothers and sisters? It is so sad that day in and day out, year in and year out, you might have come across this verse. But does it speak to you? Does it awake you? Does it stir you? Does it disturb you? That you may not be in the Lamb's Book of Life. And if you are not in the Lamb's Book of Life, brothers and sisters, what is going to happen to you when you die, when you are hit by a car, when you die of a heart attack, when you suddenly die? And you have no more, no more opportunity to repent. Look at what you are told there in Revelation 20. And look carefully, brothers and sisters, at verse 15. It says there, And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Oh my beloved brothers and sisters, do you not care about your future? Are you a fool? In your desire to live a comfortable life, to enjoy your life in this world, have you sacrificed your future so much so that you don't even care that you are heading to the lake of fire that is forever, brothers and sisters? And yesterday I was sitting with my cousin. He was sitting on the table, the next table, and he's a seven-day Adventist. And throughout uh, my conversation with him, not yesterday, but throughout my time in the past, when I first became a Christian with him, he was trying to convince me that there is no hell. Hell is not real. Hell is just a frightened people. And there I was as a young Christian, I was very confused. But the more through the years now that I read the Bible, and I find myself reading again and again of the warning that not only is hell real, there is a lake of fire that burns forever, brothers and sisters. I ask you this morning, are you concerned enough that you are in the book of life? And not just you, but that your loved ones. Are you ever, have you ever been concerned enough that like what I what happened to me a few days ago that I immediately say, my wife, Lord, my sons, Lord, are you please put your name in, Lord, have mercy on them, have mercy on me. We are very much, Lord, we need to be in this book of life that belongs to Christ, the Lamb of God. And so I pray with you this morning, my beloved brothers and sisters, that you belong to the people of God. God is gathering a people. The question is, are you one of them? Do not take things for granted. Do not assume. Do not presume. Who are these people? They are the people who thirst. As we are told that, if you look carefully there, can you look at Revelation 21 and verse 6? What are you told there in verse 6? It says, And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. You are in the Lamb's Book of Life if you thirst for spiritual things. You are in the Lamb's Book of Life if you are concerned enough. You see, if you are not in, you don't care. But if you are one of those who are in, you, you want to make sure. So are you one of those who want to make sure that you are really a Christian? Or you assume and you presume and it doesn't matter to you whether you are in or out because it, it is of no importance to you and concern to you. That is a very, very, very bad sign. Can you turn to what Paul said in Philippians chapter 4 about this matter? There in Philippians chapter 4. And look at what he says. In verse 3, it says there in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 3, 
And I urge you also, true companion, help this woman who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Oh, beloved brothers and sisters, do you stand with others who are also in the same book of life? I wonder whose name is before <coughs> yours and whose name is after yours, brothers and sisters. And if you have a chance to open that book of life, do you look out for the name of your children, your parents? Do you, do you care enough to see whether your brother or your sister, they are in? And if they are not in, what are you going to do about it, brothers and sisters? Will you say, oh God, oh God, I cannot find their name, Lord, and mercy, Lord. I plead with you, I'm willing to do anything. I'm willing, Lord, I'm willing to do anything, even to be accursed, that their name may be written in the Lamb's Book of Life, brothers and sisters. Look at what Paul said in the book of Romans chapter 10. Look at how he felt for those unbelieving Israelites. Romans 10, look at verse 1. It's from Paul. Paul is a He's a Calvinist. He believed in the sovereignty of God. But look at what he says. He says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of, of God. And brothers and sisters, this is what we are told here. Now turn back to chapter 9. Again you find his heart being manifested for his own people. Romans 9. I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing my me witness in the Holy Spirit. That I had great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh. You see there, Paul was concerned when he realized that his countrymen, his relatives, his brethren, their names were not in the book of life. And he said that he is willing to do anything within his human power to put their name in that book of life. I ask you, brothers and sisters, do you show the same concern when you read the Bible? When you hear the Lord saying, I will be their God, and they will be my people, has it ever occurred to you to immediately say, Lord, what about my son? What about my daughter? What about my father? What about my mother? Lord, what about my church member, my church friends? What about them, Lord? Yes, it is your pastor's duty to pray for you. But are you concerned about your own salvation? I ask you this morning. I want you now to turn back once again to that verse in Revelation 21 and look once again at verse 3 and learn another thing there about the future, the message that you ought to learn as you read through the Bible. It says that, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and He will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Well, brothers and sisters, don't you learn? Have you not seen it here? The lessons are so obvious that God is dwelling with his people. Not only is he gathering his people, his intention is gathering his people so that he may dwell with them and they with him. That has always been the purpose of God. Why did God create Adam and Eve? Why did God in the beginning created the heavens and the earth? Why did He make such a beautiful garden called the Garden in in Eden? And there He planted a garden with all beauty and there God dwelt. What was the purpose of the Old Testament tabernacle that we find it being reminded of here in Revelation 21 and the temple too in Jerusalem. 
It is always this, brothers and sisters. The tabernacle and the temple in Jerusalem, they were all meant to remind you that God has a house among you. You have a house. God has a house. You stay in your house. God stay in his house. And his house is near yours. God is your neighbor. God wants to be your neighbor. And God wants to stay with you. You see how wonderful it is? I will be their God. They will be my people. I will dwell among them. That's what we are told. Verse 3. And he will dwell with them. Have you ever thought about that? Because for most of us, brothers and sisters, we, we, we think that Christianity is go to church on Sunday. And after you go to church on Sunday, that's it. I'm a Christian, but that's it. We forget, you see, brothers and sisters, that God wants to dwell with us. Meaning to say, where we go, God wants to go with us. Where we come, God wants to come with us. Where we eat, He wants to eat with us. And where we stay, He wants to stay with us. God is our constant companion. Have you ever thought about that? That God wants to be involved in your lives, in your marriage, in your parenting, in your work, in your travel. Oh, brothers and sisters, that is why the Apostle Paul asks you, right, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Because God is your constant companion. That was what God did with Adam and Eve before they sinned against Him. That was God's intention before the garden in Eden. That was His intention when He told Moses that the tabernacle of the meeting that He was instructed to, to build must be right in the center where the twelve tribes dwelt. Why? Because God wanted to hear everything. He wanted to be happy. He wanted to be in the midst of His people. He wanted to be in the midst of their activities. When they needed help, God is there to help them. When they rejoice and celebrate, He wants to rejoice and hear the joy of their celebration. That is why, brothers and sisters, we ought to be reminded that the purpose of our lives, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them, brothers and sisters. And isn't that what it is all about, Christmas? What is Christmas? Christmas, you are again reminded and reminded again that God came to man. Why did Jesus come? Why He bothered to be born among us? Why did God send His Son into this world? That He may be with us. You see that? Why is Christmas so special? The other religions, their holy day can never replace Christmas. Why? Because Christmas has a message that nobody else can throw away, and that is God with us. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us, He abides with us. And that is a very precious thing. But I ask you this morning, my beloved brothers and sisters, is it precious to you, is it important to you that your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life and that it is important for you to realize that the intention of God is that you may dwell with Him and that He may be your constant companion. You realize that it became closer and closer, not just the Son of God being sent into this world to be our Emmanuel. You realize that when the Holy Spirit was given to you, the Holy Spirit entered you and your body became the temple of the Holy Spirit. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and what are you told there about yourself, brothers and sisters, your very human body? What is it meant to be? 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and what are you told there in verse 19? <clears throat> Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Meaning to say, brothers and sisters, why is the Holy Spirit staying with me? Why is He staying in my body? Why? Because God with us. God wants to be involved personally in your life, brothers and sisters. So it is a great sin, isn't it? 
when you tell God, Lord, please, get away. And you draw a curtain, and you think that this curtain can block God from your conversation, can block God from whatever sinful things you are doing, and that you, you think that this curtain can block God from following you. Your great sin, brothers and sisters, is not that you kill somebody. The great sin that you commit every day is that you block God away with your VPN or whatever you may call it. And yet God lives in your body, your temple. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, meaning to say when you feel the last of the flesh, the last of the eyes and the pride of life, the Holy Spirit knows you. You close the door and you go to internet and you think nobody saw, the Holy Spirit resides in you. He sees with the same pair of eyes. And he saw what he was seeing. He's a constant companion, brothers and sisters. So let me tell you this, that God is dwelling with his people. That is it. And if you are really His people, you welcome this. There is no greater joy than to dwell with God, isn't it? I mean, why did I, why did I really, I mean, why did I say, Lord, please add my wife, please add my two sons, please add, please add my elders, please add everybody, I name your name. I really did, I, I, I mentioned, I took a, a few minutes just to go through all your names. Why did I say that? Because I believe that you, you want to be with God. Only those who want to dwell with God wants to be in the Lamb's book of life, isn't it? And so I plead with you this morning. I plead with you. Very honestly, I plead with you. Are you concerned that your name is in the Lamb's book of life? And do you, do you, do you really want to be in the Lamb's book of life? That's it. Because if you don't want to stay with God, if you don't want God to be in your life, if you are not interested in God at all, then may I just tell you, you will be a miserable person, even if your name is found in the land of of life, because that's not what you want. If that's not what you want, will you thirst? Will you desire? Look at what you are told there. In the book of Revelation 22 and verse 17, Concerning the second coming of Jesus Christ, the spirits and the bride said, the spirit refers to the Holy Spirit, the bride refers to the church. Come, and let him who say, come, and let him who thirst, come, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Look there, these words are, huh? thirst, and these words, desires. I ask you this morning, can they be used to describe you? Do you have this spiritual thirst? And do you have this spiritual desire? Oh, brothers and sisters, I'm concerned for many of you as we come to the end of the 018. I'm concerned for my, my family too. I'm really concerned for myself because the world is getting more and more real to us so much so that brothers and sisters we find that the things that is of God seems to have diminished its importance in our lives. Our commitment to God seems to be diluted again and again this passing year. May God have mercy on us. God is gathering a people and God is planning to dwell with His people and I pray God that you are going to be in that people that God is gathering and planning to dwell with. The third thing I want to draw your attention to, which is the last point, is found again, brothers and sisters, here in Revelation 21 and verse 3. The Holy Bible says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people. God Himself will be with them and be their God. You realize that God is gathering a people, God is planning to dwell with them, and because God is gathering a people to dwell with Him, 
he also at the very same time is preparing a new world for this to take place. And so here we find the word new, 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 new. Look there in verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And then in verse 2, a new Jerusalem. Look at verse 5. Behold, I make all things new. Meaning to say, absence of sin. Everything that were given to sin, no more. Their memory erased. The, the things no longer trouble us. Our sin removed. And everything will start as if from a blank, clean sheet sheet of paper and God begins a new relationship with His people. You realize that this thing about a new heaven and a new earth and a, a new place and God is preparing for the people that He is planning to dwell with in forever. It, it, this is not something new. Really, this is not something new. In fact, it was already from the words of our Lord Jesus Christ promised by Him. Can you turn to the Gospel of John? Look at what Jesus himself said. The promise that Jesus himself made to those who would listen to him and love him. Look there in John 14. John chapter 14. Look at our Lord. What he said in, in from verse 1 to verse 2. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. You believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Isn't it wonderful, brothers and sisters? God is gathering His people. God is preparing a place for Him to dwell with His people. God is preparing a place that is new. It's new in the sense that it is untainted with sin. And not just that it is a world that is unseen yet by human beings on this side of life. I ask you now, brothers and sisters, are you interested to dwell with God in that new world? Or is this current world, this present world, such a great attraction to you that you find that ayya, you find that ayya, you cannot break off its addiction? The world holds you so deeply. You are so entrenched in this world and culture and fashion and music and sight that you find that no la Lord, no la, I'm quite happy here. I that I don't mind staying here. I don't mind having what I've been having all this time. Lord, I thank you very much. You can count me out and pass me by. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, you are a great fool. Because this world, as we see, will not last forever. Even the Bible say, And I saw a new heaven, and I saw a new earth, implying this, you know, <coughs> that the old will be destroyed. Because if the world is still in existence, there is no need for the new. When you have something new, means you are replacing the old. And yet, if you are still loving the old, and the world is going to be burned by fire, are you a fool? You will be burned by fire too. So it's very important for you to look carefully at verse 4. Revelation 21, and look at verse 4. At this new world. And remember, this current world, huh? remember now. And look at what will happen in that world that is about to come. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. In that world to come, there shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There shall be no more pain. For the former things have passed away. All this misery occurred because of sin. When you remove sin, all these things disappeared. Where there is no sin, there is no pain, there is no crying, there is no sorrow, there is no death, for the wages of sin is death. And when there is no more sin, there is no dying. 
What a world, brothers and sisters. Can you just imagine what a wonderful world that is? And then further on, you read there in verse 23. It talks about the city has no need of the sun, no sun, no moon, no need. Why? Because God is there. And because God is there, there is light. How wonderful. Not just that. Verse 25 says, there is no night at all. There's something else that is going to be missing in that new world. You know what that is? Chapter 21 and verse 1 says, Also, there was no more sea in the new heaven and the new earth. Beloved brothers and sisters, are you excited? When you think about the world that is about to come, are you ready for it? Do you desire and say, Lord, add my name, please. Lord, have mercy. Add me. Lord, I'm not sure whether I'm in it, Lord, but please, whatever it is, please remember me. I want to be there, Lord. I want to be there, not because it is a world where you know, the roads and the places are all covered with pure gold and expensive stones. No, bro, Lord, I want to be there because you are going to dwell with your people. You are going to be there with your people, bro, Lord. And I want to be there because I want to be your people. And so I plead with you, brothers and sisters, are you concerned enough for your own soul, your own soul? What is, what is stopping you? What is, what is holding you back? What is, what is pulling you and what is binding you? What, what is pulling you away from God? What sin is it? Is it worth it? No, brothers and sisters, nothing is worth it. Nothing is worth it that will keep you away from God. Can you turn to Matthew 21, uh, Matthew 11, Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 11, please, and look there at verse 28. The words of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ says, "Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me." For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Will you come this morning, my brothers and my sisters? Will you at least this morning show some concern for your own spiritual well-being? And then when you think about it, will you now feel something and stirring in you? that will indeed cause you to think about the people you consider to be your friend and loved ones? Are you not interested to know that their names are also in the lands of life? Or are you so cruel, so hardened in your feeling that you'd rather not know and let them slip into the lake of fire that burns forever? Come, brothers and sisters, come. Come. Come to the Lord Jesus who promises you one thing, it's a four-letter word. It's rest. You know what is rest? Rest is coming. And you're no longer feeling any burden. There is no longer any, any, any pressure. Rest is something that you feel that you are relieved. You know, you come and you realize, finally, finally, finally I'm home. I don't need to think so much anymore. I don't need to worry that people will steal my luggage. I don't need my, to worry whether my luggage is overweight. I don't need to worry about whether the, the plane will take off. No, I'm home. I'm home, I can relax. I'm safe. I'm back. I have found Jesus Christ to be precious. So I ask you this morning now, as you read through the Bible this year, have you arrived at this message, the heart of the gospel message? You have found Jesus Christ. He is really your Emmanuel, God. As you read through from Genesis to Exodus and Leviticus and all the way, and then come to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and all the way down to Revelation, you get more and more excited and more and more concerned for those who love you. you live your life now in hope of eternal life, whatever you do, you want to make sure, Lord, meet. Please 
please let my name be in this book and please let my loved ones to be in that book. And as your pastor, I pray, Lord, please remember all these people in front of me in that book. And together let us pray. Come. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. Let us pray.